Okay, so uh, today we are continuing our discussion of Chinese art, right? This is uh, the unit on China and Korea. I will probably also talk a little bit uh, about um, Vietnam in this section because uh, Vietnamese art was uh, really influenced uh, by Chinese imperial culture. So we'll talk about that um, later when I get to Vietnam. Um, so I did a little bit of an intro last class. Um, if anybody wasn't there, um, I'll do like the super brief version right now. So we're going to be looking at art from China starting from the earliest time period. Um, the first artworks that we have been looking at have been um, pottery. Um, and pottery develops in China like earlier than anywhere else probably in the world. Um, it develops really, really early uh, in China. And then we will look at today art related to death practices. So objects that have been found in ancient burials in China. Um, we're going to look at this kind of silk robe that's painted um, from um, a high class elite um, burial. And, uh, and then we'll look at sort of like the introduction of Buddhism into China and how uh, rulers in China use uh, Buddhism and Buddhist imagery to consolidate their power. Um, so for example, we'll look at one, you know, sculpture of the Buddha. So the, the, the emperors and rulers were um, spending a lot of money on building these kind of um, rock cut shrines buddhist shrines and with carvings of the buddha in like carved into the side of the cliff or the rocks and like one i think i mentioned this on thursday like one ruler had the face of the buddha sort of depicted like his own face um so we'll look at examples of like how how buddhism and power are tied in china um and then we will look uh at imperial the imperial history of china and art that's produced in the courts <clears throat> so that's sort of like um, the scope of what we're going to be looking at. Oh, and then of course at the end, as always, we'll look at modern and contemporary art uh, in China. Uh, and so today we're going to be looking at um, this earliest Chinese art. And I, I mentioned this uh, when we had our last class that uh, we think of China as this like sort of monolithic culture, um, but that it's really, really diverse. Um, in terms of ethnicity, the religions that people have practiced historically, the ruling parties, um, different environments, ecologically speaking. So this is something that I think that we learned about India as well, that like it's not a monolithic culture. There are people practicing different religions, um, you know, carrying on different traditions. Um, and this means that there's a wide variety and like diversity in the arts as well. So this is what we'll look at. Um, over the next few weeks. Uh, we also talked um, in our last class uh, before we all became um, self-quarantined, um, we, talk we talked about these three main belief systems, um, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism that really influenced uh, Chinese culture historically. So who wants to sum up for me um, one of these um, systems? You want it to only be me talking? <laughs> Come on, somebody talk to me. <laughs> Tell me that you're alive. <laughs> Please. I want to talk to a human. <laughs> Come on. What do you remember about I one of these me. things? Confucianism, isn't that the one that's the relationship between people? So um, like parent and child or like leader and followers, right? Yes. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thank you, somebody for talking to me, a real human. Yes, Confucianism is um, this belief system that's really sort of like laying out the social structure for Chinese culture. Um, and that's one about sort of hierarchies, power hierarchies, uh, and, you know, establishing these systems where the people are obedient to the emperor, um, children are obedient to the parents, et cetera. So it really kind of establishes the hierarchical social structure 
uh, of China historically. Okay, and then Ben says, Taoism was super chill. Would anybody like to expand on that? How chill was it? What was it about? Uh, wasn't Taoism more about like connecting with nature and just being really like at peace? Like it was finding man's relationship with nature. Yes, Taoism is um, this philosophy that is really um, looking at the balance between humans and nature um, and sort of like that search for um, inner balance, inner peace, this concept of yin and yang of these balancing opposite forces uh, comes from Taoism. Uh, and we, we, we talked about Taoism and how, you know, sort of like some of the beliefs are like, you know, all of these, these tools that we use to like live well, we can learn by like sitting still in nature, right? Like sitting still and like, you know, meditating or, you know, contemplating a hill or a tree and, you know, that we can be strong and rooted like the trees, um, but like the branches of the tree, we can like move in the wind and that like nature can teach us these lessons about how to live and how to be. Yeah. Something we all have time for now. This is correct, Ben. <laughs> this is true. We now have time to practice this, to put our Taoist um, beliefs into practice. Um, and then um, Buddhism, I know that you already know about um, because we've talked a great deal about Buddhism already when we talked about uh, India, right? Um, but of course, we'll see how it changes as Buddhism is brought into China. Um, and it comes into China in the first century in the, of the common era. Um, and like, we'll see that like Buddhism like is really easily accepted into China um, because it doesn't really conflict with any of the pre-existing systems. And I mean, kind of the same thing happened in India when we like, we saw like pre-existing traditions that are like, you know, um, sort of like the heritage of Hinduism um, and these local religions that already existed. Um, a similar thing happens in China, like Buddhism is able to sort of like seamlessly meld into Chinese culture. And we'll see that also when we get to Japan, where there again are pre-existing religious practices. Um, there's sh the Shinto religion in Japan. Um, and these kind of belief systems cover different areas of life. So for one example is like in Buddhism, there's not really the concept of marriage, right? Um, but Shinto religion in Japan does have um, a marriage ritual. Um, so they're not at odds, these belief systems. So this is something that we'll see um, when we get, when we talk about China, but also when we get to Japan. Okay, so um, in the last class, we started looking at art from the Neolithic period, and particularly we looked at Yangshao culture vases. Um, and so we looked at a few examples of these. We kind of reviewed um, how um, the process of making ceramics, like how most of these objects uh, are made. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about the designs, these kind of abstracted designs, geometric designs that um, are coming from or based on con concepts from nature. So you'll see, um, I don't know, can you see my arrow moving around on the screen? Yeah. Okay, so you'll see here, like, because I don't have my laser pointer. This is my laser pointer. Um, you can see these kind of like wave patterns. You can see patterns on here that look, resemble leaves um, or, you know, like, I don't know, beans or fruits and vegetables, things like this. Um, so really patterns that are coming from nature, um, but have been abstracted and turned into these more geometric designs. Uh, and the thing that I want to point out about these is that these are from the third millennium BCE. So thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, also known as a long, a long ass time, time ago. ago. <laughs> Thank you. A long ass time ago. Yes, yeah, so these are really, really, really old, and this develops in China really, really early, like earlier perhaps than anywhere else in the wor world. Um, most of these um, ceramic objects are found um, from a grave site um, from the Yangshao culture. So this is like the term that's kind of applied to all of these um, Neolithic cultures around China um, that are producing this kind of pottery. Um, and I wanna remind you that Neolithic people are living mostly nomadic lifestyles, um, not staying in one place too long, hunting and gathering, 
in some areas, probably fishing. Um, and then as um, we're moving forward, we see people um, also starting to farm. But they're, my point is that they're developing pottery and making pottery before they settle down um, and start practicing agriculture, which is really unusual. Usually those things are tied um, in other parts of the world that like once people settle down, then they start making pottery. But in China, people were making pottery before that. Um, there is, um, in these early years, like little evidence of social stratification, so we don't see like palaces or anything like that. But this does come later, obviously, in China, like China is known for its imperial culture, so social stratification is on its way, thanks to Confucius and other thinkers. Um, okay, so this is what we talked about last class. We looked at Yangshao uh, pottery, and you can see, like in this image, like some some of them are really extraordinary. They're quite large. They're surprisingly intact for how old they are. They're in really great shape. Um, and then others are more simple, right? So this pot that we're looking at, this bottle um, with this kind of like mushroom tip shape, um, is you know. Um, a little bit more simple than um, some of the other Yangshao pottery. Um, another thing that we're going to look at uh, when we're looking at the earliest art in China, and also this will like travel all throughout Chinese art history, is jade. Um, and here I have a really nice quote um, that's attributed to Confucius. Like, who knows um, if Confucius actually said this, but this is attributed to Confucius. Soft, smooth, and glossy. It appeared to them like benevolence, fine, compact and strong, like intelligence. Uh, so this is a very poetic <laughs> description um, of jade. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be looking at how jade is used uh, in Neolithic China and really throughout, even into the imperial period. Jade is like a really valuable substance um, in China. And in Chinese, they use this word yu, which actually like, doesn't just refer to jade, it refers to like various green stones. So like jade, I, serpentine. So there are other green stones that aren't true jade, um, but this term kind of applies to all of them. And this is really the most highly prized material in Neolithic China, definitely more valuable than it, later than any metals, right? Um, and this is something that we see in other parts of the world as well. Like if you've ever studied um, ancient Mesoamerica, you know that jade and feathers were more valuable to the indigenous people than silver and gold, right? So like those are European constructs. Um, and we see jade used for ceremonial weapons, ritual objects, ornaments, um, objects that would be worn by like a king, a queen, somebody of high status um, and when they're buried. Um, and jade is considered to have some kind of um, magical properties. Um, and you've probably like seen some jade nowadays. There's like a really popular trend of um, jade rollers. Does anybody know about those? Yeah. <laughs> I actually have one. Hold on, I'll show you. It's show and tell time. <laughs> Did you know you were coming to kindergarten and we were going to do show and tell? This is the benefit of me um, teaching from home is I have things in my house that you might uh, like to see. So this is like supposedly, who knows, um, supposed to be good for your skin um, if you roll jade on your skin. Um, no shame. I have one made of opal. Do you, oh, yeah, I have actually like I got this for Christmas. And it comes with other stones, rose quartz. Oh, that's nice. And what's this one, amethyst? Mm -hmm. Amethyst, yeah. I got this for Christmas, thanks to my sister-in-law. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know. It has magical properties. It'll it'll keep your face looking young. I mean, I am forty, so maybe this is working, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this is not how jade was actually used historically. It was more used like, as an ornament, something that would be like worn on the clothes, um, and then somebody would be buried with um, the object. Somebody of high status, so not regular everyday people. I'm going to show you a video. Can you see it? Yes. Can you hear it? Yes. 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 Oh, history begins with writing. 
and that's how we use the term prehistoric before writing. But of course, we're not satisfied with only knowing literate cultures. We want to push back further and understand the cultures that are pre-literate. But in order to invent writing, you have to have a society, you have to have some stability. And we find that at the end of the Neolithic period. The Neolithic period begins around 10,000 BCE, when we have human beings who can settle down because they've figured out how to domesticate animals, they figured out how to farm, how to raise crops, and that brings some stability. They don't have to live a hunter-gatherer existence anymore. This is known as the Neolithic Revolution. And it really was a revolution. It completely changed human beings' way of relating to nature. We could, for the first time, control nature to some degree. This takes place after the end of the last ice age, and it may have to do with the environment becoming more hospitable. But we see this Neolithic revolution in areas all over the world that were disassociated from each other. And sometime around 3000, many of those cultures also developed writing. And writing is seen as one of the hallmarks of civilization. And we see the development of what we recognize as civilization, that is early cities, farming techniques, writing, developing in the great river valleys around the world, most famously in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in the Indus Valley, and in China. And there are several areas in China that had sophisticated Neolithic culture. One in particular is called the Yangju. This culture developed around what is today Shanghai and the Yangtze River. Right at the delta of the Yangtze River. Just like Egypt developed right around the delta of the Nile and ancient Mesopotamia developed between the Tigris and Euphrates River. It made sense. This were places where you could irrigate crops. In fact, the Liangzhu people seem to have become expert rice growers and were able to create a surplus, which allowed them not to worry about eating, not to worry about feeding themselves. It allowed at least certain elements of society to begin to develop in more sophisticated ways. The Liangzhu culture was especially known for producing beautiful jade objects, specifically something that we call sung, square hollow tubes that are decorated with lines and sometimes circles that represent faces. Some of them are short and some of them seem to be stacks that are quite tall. And we're looking actually at several examples here at the British Museum. These were found in graves. Sometimes there were many songs in graves. There were also objects called B. These are round discs, also with holes in the center. We have no idea what any of this means. This is a culture where we have found no traces of writing. It's possible that they were preliterate, or it's possible that they wrote on a material that didn't survive. But the result is, all of the ideas that surround these objects are theories. Because they clearly represent faces, whether they're monster faces or animal faces or human faces, this clearly meant something. And there's a great degree of regularity and specificity. Now, this jade is true jade or nephrite, and it is extremely hard. And this culture did not have tools that were harder than this nephrite. That is, they couldn't carve it. You can't incise into it. You can't take a knife and cut into it. It's just too hard. You can't even really scratch it. So when you look at these objects that are so precise, it's almost impossible to imagine that they were produced by rubbing sand. Some of the lines are very, very fine and run parallel to each other. It's important to think about the care with which these objects are made. They are clearly symbols. There's a uniformity, there's an intentionality, there's a clarity, and there is tremendous effort. Though we don't speak this language, we recognize it as the product of a human mind. A human mind that was trying to say something about power, perhaps, about our relationship to nature, about the spiritual world, about what happens after death, the kinds of questions that human beings ask all the time still. Their verticality, the repetition of these parallel lines, it's hard not to think about these in relationship to issues of power. Some scholars have suggested that the rectilinear quality of the song is a symbol for earth, that the round interior is a symbol of the heavens, of the sky, of the sun. These are symbols that developed later in China, and it's very seductive to link this Neolithic culture with later Bronze Age cultures. To read that definition back into time is definitely tempting. It is possible that this is the origin of those symbols, but we can't really know.
Okay, so this is what we're going to be looking at um, briefly here, these songs. Um, so here is a, a photograph of one of these um, that you saw in the video, this, this true Jade song that is this kind of, oh, you can't see me, huh? Well, you don't need to see me, but I guess here you go, you can see me. Um, this kind of um, tower that's carved with sand, apparently and that they were found in burials. So the fact that they were found in burials and the fact that there are ones that are different sizes, some that are like just sort of, you know, like one register and some that are like seem to be stacked and like multiple registers, <coughs> indicates to us that they probably have something to do with power that like people of higher status would have had larger ones probably. Um, but because these people didn't have writing and they talked about in the video how like writing is a hallmark of civilization um, but you'll see you'll notice here and you notice it if you study art history from other parts of the world too um, that in most cases um, imagery develops before written language right so there might be spoken language but um, people creating like people created <clears throat> people made images before they wrote languages down um, so this culture doesn't have a written language, so we we have to sort of speculate. And we kind of did the same thing. Um, remember that ancient site that we talked about when we studied Indian art, but it's actually in Pakistan? Do you remember what it's called? Me looking and nobody knowing Are we still it. talking about Mahendra or Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mahenjo-Daro, yay, Mahenjo-Daro. So remember we looked at Mahenjo-Daro and we saw imagery there. Um, we did see some possible writing. Um, so this is kind of a similar situation that we don't know that much about these earliest cultures because we don't have any written documentation from the time. But you saw in the video, and I think it's like a rather convincing um, a way to look at it, rather convincing argument, um, that later we will see these kind of masks or faces um, of a deity uh, used in Chinese ritual uh, <clears throat> and found in burials. And I think that these might be a prototype um, maybe, um, and it might kind of remind you of when we looked at that, do you remember that little seal with that, uh, from Mohenjo Daro with that figure seated in the lotus position that we yes. said might have been like a prototype for Shiva? Uh -huh. so it could be something similar. Like these images might be somehow sort of um, prototypes for um, later, um, later, you know, deities that are depicted in this kind of mask form. Um, mm -hmm. So you saw also in the video that there are these round um, discs that are placed in these burials. Um, all of these objects are found in burials. Um, and these discs are usually placed somewhere on the chest um, or on the stomach. Um, and so we assume that these were somehow related to death rituals and that they were obviously valuable because they were buried with these people. But beyond that, we don't know much more. So that's to say that the first kind of rituals that developed for cultures in China are around death practices um, and people starting to think about what happens after we die? Is there an afterlife? What does the body need to be buried with in order to ensure some kind of like safe or happy afterlife? So these are the beginnings of those death rituals. Um, there's a video um, in the PowerPoint um, showing a, a man working Jade, um, but you can just watch that on your own, but it's really fascinating um, to see um, Jade being worked. Um, so the link is there's a YouTube link right here that you can click on and view um, in your own time. And it shows somebody um, working um, both with like ancient ways and with modern tools. Um, and so remember that before this moment, um, we didn't, Chinese people didn't have any kind of, you know, um, metal tools. As we move into the Bronze Age, um, we'll start to see um, metal objects. <clears throat> so as we move into the Bronze Age, um, we're going to look at some objects produced under the Shang Dynasty. Um, and they develop a bronze casting method. So you might have remember, you might remember this from um, our discussions of art in India and Pakistan as well. That like those earliest cultures, the first things they were making were carving things on stone, and then eventually um, carving things, um, making sculptures with bronze. Do you remember the um, 
the dancing girl from Mohenjo-daro. Yeah. yeah. So we see bronze casting um, early as well in China. <clears throat> the basic way that these objects would be produced is a, a model would be made in clay, um, and then um, a mold would be produced, um, and then the bronze would be poured in between the mold, and the mold would be broken or removed, and then you would have the bronze object that remains. Um, and we also, let me show you some um, examples of bronze objects. So I think I showed you this one last week. Uh, so this is from the 12th or 11th century BCE. So that's like, you know, over 3000 years ago. Um, this is rather small, about like six and a half inches high. Um, and you can see that it looks to be some kind of depiction of perhaps an animal or maybe a supernatural being. It might be a prototype of some kind of dragon or something like that. Um, and you'll see that the object has um, varying levels of um, relief carving. So like some areas, so can you see this? I think this looks like an elephant, doesn't it? Yeah. It looks like a really long trunk. So it looks like there are some kind of animals there. This looks some like some kind of snake or dragon. <laughs> Um, and then you have this elephant here. So you'll see that these are, these areas are in high relief. Um, and then there are these b sort of background areas that are in low relief. And you see this like repetition of this spiral design over and over again. This spiral design you can find um, all over the world in, in ancient cultures, um, in Asia, Europe, um, South America, like spiral designs that's, you know, kind of vaguely reference the concept of infinity are, you know, shown all over the world, um, are found all over the world in ancient arts. Um, but you can see that spiral design in the background. Um, and then you can see these other elements um, are raised. So it's like quite an interesting um, and delicate mix of like low and high relief. Um, and uh, kind of, you know, we see this object as um, figurative but it's very much abstracted but we have this kind of face and eyes and what look like horns and then some kind of like spine running down the back um, and this object uh, would have been used in death rituals <clears throat> so it's a wine vessel for rice wine right not wine with grapes but rice wine um, it has all of this animal imagery on it um, and would have been used to pour rice wine um, and in some kind of ritual, probably related to death. But again, beyond that, we don't know for sure. There are some other images on this that, um, you know, I don't know exactly what they are, but it's possible that it could be some kind of glyphic writing system. Like some of these shapes um, might be glyphs um, that stand in for words. Um, but, you know, we really just don't know for sure. But this definitely looks like, doesn't this look like a fin? Do you see this? Yeah. yeah. These look like fins to me. So I don't know. It's, some, it's definitely got like an animal, animal-esque quality to it. <clears throat> um, okay, so I told you this. They're found in tombs used for pouring wine. Um, and that's kind of all we know about them. One thing that's interesting is that later, like 2000 years later in the imperial period, um, emperors collected these, they admired these objects and collected them. So they were like, you know, prized antiquities, even in times that we now consider uh, ancient. So another um, ancient bronze site in China um, where they found um, some really interesting sculptures um, is in now Sichuan province. And I think I showed these to you last class. Hold on one second. Whoa. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, so um, these bronze objects were excavated at this um, site. So again, these are bronze age objects. Um, and they found these gigantic portrait heads, uh, really huge portrait heads that we think might have been depictions of rulers and then also large like standing figures. So if you 
If I move forward um, in the PowerPoint, you can see this is one of these large standing figures. And if you go, let me go back one image. Um, I don't know if you can tell how tall this is, but this is like six feet tall. Sure. Like they're really huge. They're really, really tall. Um, and you can see um, that they're the, the hand. So it's a figure standing and then the figure appears to have some kind of um, design or maybe writing on the clothing. Um, the figure is standing on this platform that kind of looks like the face or a face mask of perhaps some supernatural being. Um, and then the figure has these really large hands. Um, that are like in this round shape and it looks like something would have been going through the object. I don't know, uh -huh. an ivory, like an elephant tusk or something like that, but it would have been uh -huh. something um, that didn't survive, obviously. Um, oh, and they mentioned this in the video that we just watched that like there might have been other things, there might have been writing, there might have been other things um that existed that like you know would help us but we just don't have them because they didn't survive like maybe you know something was written on you know some animal skin or something that deteriorated over the thousands of years um, but you can see this kind of mask like sort of face on the base of the object um and i think that's like what we see depicted on those um those songs but you know maybe maybe um, let me show you another image. So this, you, this gives you an idea of how large these objects are. So this is just a large head that is found. Um, and you can see that it's like, I don't, you know, like gigantic. Um, and I have these little miniature reproductions that I want to show you. If, if we were in the classroom together, I would let you hold this in your hand. But anyway, it's like a tiny miniature reproduction of this bronze um, object. And there are multiples, there's like different, so there are different um, faces. So this is why we think that they, they might be early portraits. They could be portraits uh -huh. of rulers because they looked, they seem to be individualized. I don't know why this guy has things sticking out of his eyes. Maybe this is not a ruler. Maybe this is a deity, right? Because have you ever seen anybody with eyes like that? I was actually wondering, is there a connection between um, these figures and then the wine vessel from the previous slides? Because they also have the similar like things coming out of the eyes. Or, oh, those are above the eyes, but... Those are horns. Oh, but they do look similar. Look at that. Mm -hmm. I never thought about that. I mean, they're produced around the same time and they're made out of the same material. So there could be some connection. Um, I think these are from different areas of China, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, these people could have had contact with each other. Um, but that's interesting. These, these things kind of poking out of the eyes look like those horns. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting. And, and I mean, this face, I mean, if we go back a few slides. Oh, I don't have a good shot of that song, but in the video, let me go to the video and just fast forward if it will let me. In the video, we saw about power perhaps. Let me find that good image where you could see where it kind of looks like a face. So it's really, really sort of vague, but you could maybe say that maybe this looks like a face, like maybe are these eyes or nostrils and the mouth, like maybe this could be some kind of prototype for a later image like this, maybe. Um, and so in this case, I would think that perhaps this depicts some kind of deity. Um, this, this, the standing figure looks human to me. What do you think? Yeah, it looks more okay. like an like a ruler or something like that. Ruler, somebody, like it looks like more, it looks human. Um, and I think this kind of looks human, um, but this face looks less human to me. Um, maybe some kind of spiritual figure. Um, and then there are these other ones um, that I don't know if I have images of in the PowerPoint. 
that's okay. I guess I don't. Um, but again, there's a gigantic, oh, look, that's eight and a half feet high with the base. I think the figure is six feet. Um, and then with the base, it's eight and a half feet high. Like that's gigantic. That's like taller than the tallest basketball player. Really good. Um, there are also these um, that I don't have an, a photograph of, but they're also these giant heads. Um, and apparently they found some that they're bronze and then this one was gilt. So like part of it had gold on it. So these may have originally been covered in gold. So they may have uh, looked different than they look now. But you can see that this one has like traces of gold on it. Um, and it kind of has like a similar face with the kind of the ears that stick out um, and the very kind of, you know, abstracted nose. Um, okay, so these uh, perhaps are some kind of head or portrait head of a ruler or maybe of some supernatural, you know, some deity, something like this. Um, really large figures. Um, and then we see in the clothing, We see on the clothing, and I think you could see that in the, the drawing, the artist's rendering of it, um, that there's all this um, writing uh, or perhaps writing and imagery um, that's like incised into the clothing. And we see that spiral design, which Hectan mentioned that it kind of reminded her of the Guang vessel that we just looked at. That spiral design that's in the background of that vessel also appears um, on the it's hard to, you can't see it in um, this photograph, but it also appears on the like front of the clothing of this figure. <clears throat> so again, we don't know exactly for sure, you know, what these stood for, what the symbolism is. You can see imagery, look at on the, the there's like a headdress and this kind of I don't know, amoeba peanut shaped thing um, that we don't know exactly what these mean, what these stand for, the symbolism of them. So a lot of this is unfortunately left to speculation for us at this point. <clears throat> but we do know that they were found in a tomb and probably of some elite individual. So they must have had some kind of um, ritual importance um, that we just don't understand at this point. And apparently, um, the size of these, these the handholds, like it could have held an elephant tusk. So um, we're just not sure. Uh, another object that is popular uh, in burials from this time period is the sicho, which is this kind of disc um, that might remind us of the disc that we were just looking at, um, but they're in jade and they're carved really elaborately. And you'll see right here, this figure um, on the exterior of the jade that looks like what? Again. A dragon. A dragon. And we'll <laughs> see as we move forward that dragons figure prominently, obviously, in Chinese art. Um, and dragons are symbols of uh, royalty in China. So that this is some kind of object, again, that would be buried um, and used um, for its ritual purposes and would be associated with um, elite status, royalty, something like this. Uh, I think I have a video. Do I have a video in here? I do. I'm not going to play it for you, um, but there is a video where they're talking about the process of making this and carving this um, into uh, jade, and um, the video is really interesting, so you should look at the video, but I'm not going to play all the videos here in Zoom because you can watch them on your own. Yeah? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. We also see, so these were found in burials um, with these, this dragon imagery on them, um, on this circular kind of hole in the center um, with, it looks like some kind of perhaps writing or imagery um, that may be associated with the heavens. Uh, and we know that these were a status symbol. They're something that um, when you're a warrior, when you'd be defeated, this would be relinquished. Like this is, you know, um, a symbol of submission would be, you know, losing 
um, your B disc or having it taken. Um, and because of this, they might have had some kind of monetary um, value as well. And in these burials, along with these B discs, they also found bronze ritual vessels. Oh, do I not have any images of those bronze vessels? Okay. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we see this image that looks like uh, it appears to be some kind of dragon. Um, and we know that dragons are associated with the heavens, with royalty. Um, and dragons were these figures that l could live in the waters, but also could fly. So they would be associated with bringing rain, right? And if you think about sort of like the hydrologic process of like water evaporating off of the sea and like moving inland with the clouds and then hitting mountains and dropping rain. Um, you could see how like some creature that lives in the sea and then flies in the sky would be, you know, associated with rains. Um, and because of this association with rains probably is associated with power and royalty. Um, you know, if you could control um, access to the dragons and you could control the rain that needs to, you know, rain down in order to help people produce agriculture, then you can control the people is like sort of the thinking, the line of thinking. Um, and we'll see more dragon imagery uh, as we move forward. Anybody have any questions so far? Crystal said, I wonder if it was holding a staff. Oh yeah, it was holding something. Those, those bronze figures, definitely holding something. Um, hold on, one of my neighbors is being loud. I'm gonna close the window. I don't know. My neighbor's like doing a video call outside and it's making my apartment loud. Okay, uh, we're back. All right, we're back. Okay, so um, somebody asked a question. I wonder if the dragons, uh, I can't read it. Can you say it? I can't, it's like it won't move around. Oh, there it is. Noemi asks, I wonder if the dragons were imagined after watching fog dissipate. I love that. Yeah, they have this kind of like, oh, Hector was thinking the same thing. Like this, this, this kind of swirly looks like clouds, right? And if you're familiar with like Chinese and Japanese art, you, you've seen clouds that are depicted like this. So yeah, maybe like fog or clouds. I love that. You're all so wise. So wise. I think so. I support that. I support that assertion. Um, okay, so what else are we going to look at today? Let's look at the terracotta warriors. You've heard of these, haven't you? These are really interesting. So we'll look at the terracotta warriors um, and then we'll look at the funeral banner of Lady Di. So this is that silk banner that I told you about earlier. Um, okay, so the terracotta army, the terracotta warriors you've heard of before, right? Um, these are um, these, you know, thousands, 8,000, 8,000 soldiers that are made from ceramic earthenware. And you'll remember from last class that earthenware is ceramic that's low fired, making it less resistant than stoneware, which is high fired. So high fired ceramic is harder. Earthenware is more fragile, but they did survive all of these, um, you know, thousands of years um, because they were buried over and they were found in the 1970s by a farmer. What do they look like? So this is what the archeological site looks like today. Pretty cool, right? So there are 8,000 of these warriors um, set up, kind of laid out, uh, almost as if they're a standing army um, who are meant to protect the tomb of the emperor who's buried um, behind all of them. In addition to all of these um, terracotta warriors, there are also bronze objects. There are large scale bronze horses, um, carriages. Let's see if I have um, photographs of those objects as well. Oh, I don't. Okay. Um, you know what? 
I want to show you this video because I think in the video you can see the bronze objects. In 1974, the fertile grounds of Xi'an, China yielded a spectacular... Can you see this or no? No. no. Okay, hold on. Let me... I'm going to show it to you because um, I want you to see this video. All right. Uh, la, 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 la. Sorry, I'm still learning how to do this. Okay. I need like two monitors. <laughs> I like, I have one. Okay. I have a laptop that died yesterday in the middle of class. Their secret. Can you see it now? Buried in the soil, yeah. farmers found a beautifully sculpted head. One by one, soldiers emerged until an entire clay army was unearthed. Each individual painstakingly handcrafted and ready for battle. It's a military force of thousands, created 8, to escort the founding father of the Chinese Empire into eternity. Qin Shu Huangdi came into power in 246 BC when he was just 13 years old. Qin spent most of his ruling years at war, uniting much of what is now China. He standardized writing, currency, weights and measures, and even built a series of highways. And he commissioned the first version of the Great Wall. Despite Qin's enormous achievements, he wanted more. He wanted immortality. He began building a second empire, one that would accompany him into the afterlife. It would become one of the largest mausoleums on earth. More than 7,000 warriors, archers, cavalry, charioteers, and foot soldiers guard his tomb. Chin envisioned his life after death to include civilians as well, government officials to serve him, acrobats, dancers, singers, animals, and even a strong man to entertain him. It took over 36 years and a workforce of 700,000 conscripted workers to complete Chin's terracotta army and court. Workers accomplished the enormous task by dividing up the labor in assembly line fashion. And they're coil and pots. Did no you see that? statues are the same. Each depicts an individual with its own hairstyle, facial expression, and painted details. The warrior's craftsmanship and style astonishes scholars. Why would an emperor want each of his troops to be unique? Perhaps for Qin, beauty and individualism were as important as compliance and uniformity. We can only speculate based on the contents of the mausoleum, for Qin left no records of this grand creation. Records from the next dynasty indicate that Qin was not a popular ruler. He massacred the armies of six states, had hundreds of thousands of people punished through forced labor, subjected his people to high taxation, and showed little tolerance for dissent. Qin outlived numerous assassination attempts and was quite paranoid about revolution. He may have thought these threats would follow him into the afterlife. The army faces east toward states Qin conquered during his lifetime, as if he anticipated vengeful troops coming over the horizon. In fact, his own warriors may have armed the revolt that did come after his death. Peasants snatched the metal swords from the clay soldier's grasp and overthrew Qin's successors. But despite looting, fires, and the passage of time, Qin's army survived into the modern world. So cool. A group of Qin's clay figures is now on tour. It will be on display at the National Geographic Museum in Washington, D.C. in November 2009. It's an old video, honestly. Okay, so. Let me go back. Uh, to our PowerPoint. Share screen, PowerPoint. Okay, so um, you saw in the video 
these terracotta warriors of this this first emperor in China, and I think I didn't mention this earlier, but like this is the this is the ruler in China who unites people for the first time and like sets up the first sort of empire, right? So before this, people are living. Um, more dispersed. Um, there might have been like local rulers in different parts uh, of what we now know of as China. Um, and this emperor comes along and um, conquers these different areas and unites China and sort of sets up the first empire. So this is kind of the beginning of the imperial period uh, in China. Um, and we're looking at like the mid 200s BCE, so like roughly around the time of like ancient Greece, um, just to give you like um, a sense of where we are um, in history, in the chronology of history. So let's look at these. So the objects are set up, there are 8,000 of them. And you saw in the video that it took like hundreds of thousands of people to set this up and build this. Um, but there are 8,000 of these warriors that are set up to protect the tomb of the emperor. And you'll see that if you look at them closely, and I think you can see it here, um, that their faces are uh, appear to be individualized. Like some of them have mustaches, some of them don't. They have different hairstyles, different headdresses. Some of them have this little bun, others don't. Some of them have helmets. Um, they have different attire, different arm shapes. And, um, some even expressions. What's that? Some even have different facial expressions. Yes, they have different facial expressions. So how did they make these? Um, they actually made these um, from a mold. So you saw in the video that they, when they showed somebody making one. So they made them like by coiling, like, like a coil pot. Has anybody ever taken ceramics? So in a ceramics class, the first thing you learn before you learn how to work on a wheel is you take clay and you roll it out to a long coil, almost like a piece of spaghetti, like a long worm. And you take it and you wrap it around and you make a circle with it. And you take another coil and you make another circle with it. And you pile these on top of each other and then you blend and smooth the edges until you get like a vessel. Like this is how you make a cup or like some basic object, right? By using these coils. So these are made with um, like, it's like a coil pot method, but they're also um, using um, a mold. So they're making the kind of, maybe making the torso and then using a mold um, to get the designs uh, of the shirts, the arms. You'll see some of the arms are bent. Some of them are hanging straight down. They have different facial expressions, different headdresses. Um, and different sizes of legs, like this guy is a little bit bigger than this guy, but they're making molds. So actually, they're, these are not handmade. There is some sense of uniformity and they're just mixing like different um, legs with different torsos with different heads. They're kind of like Mr. Potato Heading them. Do you know what Mr. Potato Head is? <laughs> yeah. Some people. Um, somebody had, we were working on that earlier this month. Ben, um, we, are you in a ceramics class, Ben? Yes. Okay. So you made a coil pot. So these are made with coils. Um, and then once the object is made, then it's pressed into a mold. Um, and so the heads and the, the heads, the arms, the torsos, the lower body and the legs are kind of all interchangeable. So even though each figure looks totally unique, um, so you won't find like the same combination of like heads and arms and legs, um, there is a sense of uniformity. Like there's not really like the ability to kind of stray from the design, um, which I think is a really interesting tactic. Like it really means that this emperor had like a great deal of control or somebody, whoever was in charge of this project, had a great deal of control over like the overall visual of how this would have looked. Um, so it's, it's, I think, a really fascinating um, example and such an early date for such a massive art project. Here you can see that they're faces are um, individualized.
Some of them are quite tall, quite large. This one's six foot four, um, and they're sculpted with, so they're, they're using molds, but then they're like putting like finishing touches on them so that they're really individualized. And they're sculpted with a great deal of skill and sensitivity. Like these artists who are making these um, were very talented and very skilled artists. I mean, you can see the elegance of the, the folds of the sleeve and the way the sleeve um, sort of drapes down. Mm -hmm. um, you can see all of the elaborate design on the armor that the soldier is wearing. Um, the care that's taken with, you know, molding the cheekbones um, and the, you know, the wrinkles in the forehead of the figure, like a great deal of sensitivity to detail. One thing that you might not notice um, just from looking at them is that they were originally painted. Um, so they would have looked something more like this. Um, and so this is something that I think people are always shocked by, um, even when we're looking at like ancient Greek art as well, like Greek and um, Roman statues would have been painted as well. So they would have looked really different. Um, they would have looked really vibrant, really colorful, um, more lifelike, right? Because they're painted. Um, and then, okay, so I think I talked about this idea of like, um, using the molds creates this sense of unity, cohesion, and uniformity. So the bodies are kind of standardized. They're all frontal. They're all kind of stiff. They're all somewhat abstracted. Um, so they, there's a sense of uniformity, like the army is unified to protect the emperor, right? But um, all of these varying combinations and the different colors that could have been applied by the painters create this sense of individuals. Um, so they're individuals, but part of this unified whole. It's a really like interesting and complex way of thinking about laying out this um, mausoleum. And we know what a mausoleum is, right? A fancy burial, yeah? Because we learned that when we talked about that really famous mausoleum in India. Who remembers? Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, okay, so um, they're, they're painted terracotta, painted earthenware. Um, so they're fired, and this is what has kept them strong. Um, and then they're painted over. You can see by looking at this image here that, you know, the the paint is is long gone, but there are traces of paint on them. And this is how we know that they would have originally been painted like this. Um, and do you see this, do you see this armor, this kind of like chain mail thing? Does anybody remember seeing um, a Japanese armor, samurai armor in the museum? Oh yeah, I saw it. We, when we went um, to the USC Pacific Asia Museum, they had um, a Japanese samurai kind of armor and it was similar like this. Um, so you can imagine like that thing that we saw in the museum, something like that is what soldiers would have been wearing also in China in, you know, 200 BCE. Uh, I think these are really impressive. You can also see um, that their hands would have been holding weapons. Um, and they didn't show you in the video um, the, the bronze objects, but there's also um, a bronze carriage and bronze horses that are life-size. So like a huge life-size bronze sculpture um, is a major investment in terms of time um, and money and artwork. Uh, oh, somebody sent something in the chat. I'm going to open it. Ah, yes. Great. How do I share this? New share. Do you see this? Whoops. Make this go away. Hello? Where'd it go? There. Do you see this? Yes. This is the one. Thank you for sending this. Kimberly. Um, this is the one from the museum. So it's a little bit different, but you can imagine kind of, you can imagine kind of that this is um, a similar kind, you know, this is Japanese, not Chinese, and it's a samurai, um, samurai warriors costume that's like from a long time later, but it kind of just gives you the idea of um, what this armor would have looked like uh, in real life. Okay. Thank you for sending that, Kimberly. Uh, okay, so these are the terracotta warriors. Really, really fascinating 
massive monumental project that, you know, it's a tomb, but these objects really are, these sculptures are works of art. Um, and really the first kind of major um, artwork on the kind of imperial level um, in ancient China. The last thing I want to look at today, um, oh, and I don't even know what time it is. Does anybody know? 12.30. What time is our class over? 12, 30, like in five minutes? Yeah, it's 12.35. Time goes by fast. Well, okay, starting next week, I'm gonna start on time. I'm gonna assume that everybody knows how to get here and I'm gonna start on time and I'm not gonna spend as much time like going over things in the beginning. But anyway, um, the last thing I wanna show you um, is um, this funerary banner from the tomb of Lady Dai, who's this um, Han dynasty elite woman. So um, during this time period, this is the second dynasty after Qin, the Qin Quan, Quan the dies, this one who does the, um, the terracotta warriors. After this um, dynasty is the Han dynasty, the second dynasty. Uh, and this dynasty, these rulers are buried in very elaborate, well-furnished tombs with all of these objects that they might need uh, in the afterlife. Um, and one, of, one such tomb was found in like really, really great condition. Um, and we're going to look at this funerary banner, which is made of silk. Um, silk has a long tradition in China. Um, these like hand of these handmade objects. So you can like think about like regular everyday people were wearing like pretty basic clothing, like not colorful, not silk. Um, like a laborer or a peasant would wear like sort of like beige, brown, plain clothes, but um, wealthy officials would have silk um, clothing that would be dyed with these bright colors. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that they would wear. Um, and this silk funerary banner um, is something that's draped over a tomb, but it could represent sort of like a robe that um, somebody might wear in, in their life. Um, a lot of these silk uh, fabrics are embroidered, so there's sewing on them, um, or painted. So the one we're going to look at is painted. And I think if you um, went in that room at the USC Pacific Asia Museum, there was a whole thing about um, the silkworm eating the mulberry leaves, making the cocoon, and then they're steamed before they hatch, right? Like this is the process of um, how um, the silk thread um, is taken. It's from the, um, from the cocoon of the worm and the worm has to eat mulberry leaves, like not any other leaf, I don't know. Um, this is the process of how this silk thread is made and then this is woven into fabric. So it's a really long process to make this material. So as you can imagine, this material is very rare and very valuable. So the image on the right is the funerary banner from the tomb of Lady Dai from the Han Dynasty. Um, and so this is what I just want to show you in the last few minutes. Um, this um, elite tomb was found in the 1970s um, and the, the, the wife of the Marquis of Dai um, had a, her tomb was in a really good condition. Um, like you can look in the book, um, pages 55 to 57 in the book and you can see some more images. Um, but these are the three tombs that were found. One is the wife, the other one is the husband and I think the other one is their child. Um, and the wife's tomb is in really, really, really good condition. Um, the body is like buried in this um, coffin and then there are multiple levels of coffins. Um, the outermost coffin is decorated, which you can see here on your screen right now, with elaborate designs that look sort of like animals or maybe mythological creatures. Um, but the funerary banner is what I want you to look at really closely. Um, and the whole banner, um, so this would be sort of laid across the tomb, um, has these different kind of registers. Um, there's sort of like this upper heavenly realm. Um, there's the worldly realm where Lady Di um, is depicted with her attendants and people are sort of bowing before her, indicating her status. Um, and then down below, 
We see a funeral, um, the funerary practice that they're preparing for Lady Di and underneath this, um, the underworld. Um, and so you can see in the heavens, um, these dragons, and let me show you some close-ups of the different areas. So in the upper level, you have um, these dragon figures right here, which are perhaps, you know, associated with royalty. Um, and then you have this raven in the moon um, and this, uh, this raven in the sun, um, and then this toad on the moon, like on the left and the right, um, that are perhaps related to or recalling uh, mythology from Taoist mythology, so stories, ancient stories and mythology. Um, and there's a, there's a cosmological myth where like, <clears throat> there's this bird that's blocking um, the sun and like this hunter shoots it and it like ends a period of drought or something. So it's ancient mythology that appears to be depicted um, on this funerary banner. Here's another close up um, of this kind of heavenly realm. There is a figure here in the top um, who, you know, I don't know, it might be like, we don't really know who this is, but it might be the husband of the deceased woman. It might be um, some other figure. Um, perhaps this is like, you know, some human with a dragon's body. It's kind of unclear some of the imagery. Um, there are two men right here um, who perhaps are like, I don't know, guarding, like guarding the gate of um, into the heavens. Uh, and then below these figures in the central area, we see Lady Di herself. Um, with her attendants, and then these people are sort of bound, um, bowing before her. You can see that <coughs> the figures are um, on a ground line so that they're kind of grounded in real space. So there's like this mythology in the heavens, but like real space happening down here. We see hierarchy of scale used. Um, the largest figure is Lady Di, so she's larger, depicted as larger, and therefore she's more important. And of course, this references some of those Confucian ideas about like, you know, um, people of different social classes, certain people having more power um, and other people being subservient to the higher elite classes. Um, and if this is a depiction of Lady Di, which we think it is, then this would be the earliest example of a painted portrait uh, in China. <clears throat> and we think it is her. Here's a close up, a really good close up. So this would be the, the woman here with her attendants. Um, and then these like, you know, humble people bowing before her. L beneath this, we see a depiction of funerary ceremonies. You can see these bronze vessels and you might have seen some of these in the museum. I don't know if they have them at the Pacific Asia Museum. Um, but these bronze vessels that were often found in Chinese tombs um, are depicted here in the foreground. And then you see like this table and these bronze vessels and these figures, you know, um, acting out the funerary ceremonies. Um, so this is ostensibly like the funeral of Lady Di mm -hmm. herself. Um, and then at the bottom, and I don't have a good high resolution image of the bottom, but you see these kind of two giant snakes. Um, these kind of like aquatic imagery um, that are like symbolizing the water and the earth and they're underneath um, this area where there's the funerary ceremony going on. So you have like the heavens, the earthly realm, and then the underworld. Um, and these were found in this burial of this um, elite woman with all sorts of other objects that she would need in the afterlife in a really, really elaborate um, tomb uh, from the Han Dynasty of China. And I think with that, another thing that's um, often found in Han, Han Dynasty tombs are these models of houses. So it tells us a lot about um, what a house would have looked like at the time. Um, this is, I don't know, about four feet high. I don't know how big that is. You know how I'm really bad with sizes, but about four feet high. Um, and you can see that the, the homes are very um, vertical um, and then painted with um, really elaborate designs on the exteriors. And they found uh, several of these in various Han dynasty tombs. So they're really quite interesting. Um, the, the homes would have been made out of wood and so they have not survived, right? Um, but we know what the houses look like because we have these ceramic models 
that were found um, in these elite burials. Um, and I think with that, um, I'll end um, today's lecture. Uh, and you can, of course, um, return to this PowerPoint and look at it again. I do want you to finish it because there were a couple more slides talking about calligraphy. So I want you to read those slides and watch those videos about calligraphy. Um, and next week, um, we will talk about the introduction of Buddhism into China. But before then, um, I am going to post a discussion question on Canvas. I know I haven't done it yet, but I promise I will do it soon. Um, and then you're going to type your answer to that question directly into Canvas. And remember that your discussion answer is going to um, count for your uh, exam grade. Cool? Is I have that a good question. today? Yes. Sorry, what a couple people talked at once. Ask me all your questions. Okay. Is the discussion um, post? Oh, sorry. Okay, Karen, go first. <laughs> okay. The uh, it's just about the discussion posts. Are we doing these at the end of like every week? Like, is there going to be one for every week, or is there only two to cover the exams? No, there's going to be more. There's going to be more than um, two. I don't know exactly how many, but probably one a week. And I don't know how many weeks we have left. Is it six? Maybe? I think. So I don't know. Maybe there'll be, there'll be like four or five of them. OK. Um, we are going to have spring break. like So that week, there won't be anything. Um, but the rest of the weeks, there'll be something, um, maybe except for the last week. Maybe there won't be anything the last week. But there'll be like four or five of them, but definitely more than two. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Um, anybody else? Who else had a question? So the discussion poster is due today or uh, uh, by next class? By next class. You'll have yeah. a week. And in fact, um, since it's the first one, I might just leave it. Like, I'll, I'll ask you to submit it by next Tuesday, a week from today. Um, but I might leave it open for two weeks, just because it's like going to be a period of adjustment for everybody to get used to this. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll, normally you'll have a week to do it. And you'll have approximately one every week. Oh, yeah. yeah? Yeah, that's good. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Any other questions? The collaborative projects. Oh, um, yeah. You guys made up groups. We I don't did. think I was here for that one. Okay, so, bef okay, so oh, before I talk also, about that. So, what about the. Go ahead, Rudy. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, what about the groups also? Yeah, okay. So, good. So, the collaborative project. If you were here on Thursday, you can leave. You can leave the room because we're done. Yeah? If you were not here, um, stay and I'll get you into groups. Let me stop the recording. Um, bye, everybody. Okay, everybody else who's going to talk about the collaborative project, stay here. Everybody else, bye and I'll okay. see you next week. Bye. bye. Have a good day. Have a good one, everybody. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the video. Stop recording. Okay, bye everybody, see you next week. Okay. Um.